hello good morning so we were discussing about uh, the basis set and uh, last few lectures we have explained all about uh, the basis set and uh, the basis functions the types and uh, the advantages and uh, disadvantages and in this current lecture we are uh, almost about to finish uh, the basis sets only few things are left so let's see what are uh, left still so uh, we are now will discuss the effective core potential so you know again from your uh, uh, chemical intuition that uh, for a chemical reactions valence bonds are only a uh, valence electrons are only actually uh, influencing and the core electrons are uh, mostly become inactive okay so for large number of electrons means that when we consider the third row atoms and beyond in the periodic table we will have so many electrons so there will be so many orbitals and so for each orbital we have to consider the basis functions so we have to <coughs> incorporate so many basis functions also for that what will happen your calculations uh, time will be extremely high and uh, this will be extremely problematic so uh, one th more thing that these core electrons because when we uh, go beyond uh, the third row of the periodic table what actually increasing the our valence electrons are not actually increased we get more and more core cell so these core cells electrons are increasing and actually they uh, these core cell electrons have hardly any effect in bonding and other properties so what uh, we can do now to expedite our calculations so Hellman first proposed an excellent solution to this problem so what he has done he used a one electron operator that takes into account in a collective way the effect of the core electrons on the valence electrons so what is actually his idea that he considers the an one electron op operator of the total core electrons means that if you have 40 core electrons then he uh, considered that this core electron has a combined effect and it will be treated by an operator and the valence electron will be treated explicitly and then we will uh, add finally the effect of that core uh, electrons to the valence electrons so finally we will get the uh, final result okay so this is the idea of the effective core potential so this average core effect of the uh, operator means that we have to define an operator to uh, include the average core effect and that is called the an effective core potential that ECP or pseudo potential okay so what it actually does it uh, reduces the so many basis functions because the core electrons will uh, consider only a single uh, set and you will have the, your calculations will be very very fast okay so what actually it's helping that your uh, accuracy is almost becoming intact but you will get the very faster calculations so what is the difference between ecp and pseudo potential they are actually mostly synonyms but they are slightly different because uh, like that in ecp uh, ECP and pseudo potential the so pseudo potential uh, term used always uh, to approach limited to the valence electrons because in the pseudo potential only the valence electrons are considered explicitly and all the core are considered as a one average core effect okay while ECP is sometimes used uh, to designate a simplified pseudo potential corresponding to a function with a fewer orbitals than the correct functions means that in pseudo potential you will have only the core and valence but here you can uh, uh, in ecp it's that you can also use some uh, on valence also and also the next uh, uh, next to the valence cell also you can consider explicitly so there you can change your uh, the core part and you can inclu inclu include uh, more electron in the valence cell <laughs> okay so these terms are usually used interchangeably but to designate a nuclei plus a core electron potential and they are almost used as synonyms okay 
Next is relativistic uh, effect of core pot effective core potential. So you know that when we will have the very heavy elements like the block elements, like uh, you if you consider the gold, lead, this type of elements, heavy elements, then what happens there? They have actually the core electrons of that on that electrons uh, are actually have very high velocities, and they actually reach near uh, speed of light. So if you remember uh, our uh, the plot of that uh, energy versus velocity plot, uh, sorry, the ma uh, mass versus uh, velocity plot, then what will happen if the velocity is higher, then what we have to do, we have to incorporate some uh, effect from the relativistic uh, uh, corrections, okay. But still now we are uh, using the non-relativistic uh, non Hamiltonian operator. So this will be incapable of accounting for, uh, for such effects. And also this relativity has relativistic effects uh, as significant for many chemical reactions when uh, we will consider the reactions of the heavy elements of like a block elements. Okay. So relativity you know is accounted for the re relativistic form of Schrodinger equation which is actually the Dirac equation. And this equation is not commonly used explicitly in molecular calculation but is used instead used to develop relativistic effective core potential. So what actually uh, uh, we do here that we consider uh, the we incorporate a, a relativistic effect towards the core electrons and all other calculations become intact. So finally we will get the relativistic corrections on the energy or uh, other properties. So relativistic effects can begin to become significant for about third row elements that we have discussed uh, so far for first uh, that is beyond the first transition metal. So for molecules with these atoms, ECP begin to be useful for speeding up the calculations. So it makes sense to take these effects into account in developing these potential operators and their basis functions. Okay. So ECP can give more accurate results for molecules with third row and beyond atoms by simulating the electronic <coughs> relativistic mass increment. Okay. So ECP can uh, also be two types that large core ECPs means that they input everything but the outermost only in the valence cell while small core ECPs means that you are using your uh, more uh, electron in the valence but few electrons or uh, less electron uh, or you can define the small core sorry. So uh, small core uh, valence ECPs are that when you will define a few more electrons in the valence cell. So another uh, one uh, things are left just that is uh, the basis set superposition error. Okay, so this is uh, you can say that this is the we have said this is some superposition error. So this is not associated with particular method or but rather it's coming from the basis set problem. So, so let's consider an example. So if we have a water dimer and we if we want to calculate the energy of their uh, separately uh, then uh, like we have done here for using mp2 and frozen core this is a method correlation uh, correlation including method perturbation method that uh, we will discuss later and this is the basis set so for a calculations you need a method and a basis set basis set will define you the wave functions and method is actually defines the approximations to solve the Schrodinger equation Okay, so if we uh, uh, calculate the energy separately of these two water molecules, then total energy is like uh, uh, minus one five two point five five zero nine four Hartree, and also you know that we have also defined the unit of Hartree because that when we express the Schrodinger equation in atomic unit, we get the energy in Hartree unit, and then if we calculate the energy of the total dimer, then we get uh, something like this value. So now if we want to calculate the stabilization energy so we can simply calculate that when uh, they are in the we can uh, uh, minus it from that uh, the energy of the two water molecules separately minus the energy of water dimer so then you get something like 14.8 kilojoule per mole inverse so what does it mean means that you have a separate two water molecules and when they are coming uh, closer that uh, this amount of energy is become released okay 
because they, you have uh, when they are separated they have high energy and when they are uh, form dimer they have low energy so this amount of energy will be released when they form dimer so you can consider that this amount is actually coming from the stabilization energy of the water dimer okay but uh, this uh, water energy this 14.8 uh, kilocalorie this is actually uh, very high but it is actually the normally if we consider the experimental values this is not uh, so high stabilization energy so this error originates due to presence of the uh, basis set superposition error okay so let's see how uh, why uh, this error is coming so when we are calculating the dimer what is happening that this uh, we have uh, taken the basis sets so basis sets are you know the atom centered basis sets so some basis sets are uh, all uh, few basis sets for this oxygen atom and few basis set for this oxygen atom so all atom has their separate basis sets here as we have uh, given there is like 61 g star so when uh, we are calculating separately we do not have any problem but when we are calculating the dimer what will happen that when we are uh, this uh, calculations this water molecule can also use the basis function which is given for this water molecule okay so this is actually called the super molecule uh, type calculations so the basis functions of b means that if you consider that this water molecule is also available to a whereas same the basis functions of uh, a also available to b so in this in a b each of two components can borrow basis functions from each other okay so this uh, actually arise error for that there is uh, error is coming and the error arises due to imposing the basis sets uh, of b upon a or vice versa so for that it's called the superposition error okay so basis set superposition error so how can you solve this uh, uh, basis set superposition error you can correct it uh, very easily so what we can do we can take uh, this dimer uh, calculations and in the first we can calculate the energy of a with presence of the basis sets of b but uh, without presence of their atoms okay so what we will actually do we will consider the a molecule suppose this is your a molecule we will uh, calculate the energy of a in presence of the basis sets defined for b but not the presence of their atoms okay so these atoms can be uh, po possible to uh, apply as a host atoms means that they do not have any electrons or nucleus they are just host but the basis functions are will be available so means that you will get the energy of a in presence of uh, the basis set b and the same way you can calculate the energy of b in presence of the basis set of a so what are the uh, things are coming now we are getting uh, the energies of a and b with the extra functions that is called the count is called the counterpoise method okay because it balances the uh, counterpoise functions in a and b against functions a b okay so now uh, we can now uh, this way we can there will be so finally what we can uh, so you understand that one specifies for a at the positions that would be occupied by the various atoms of b in a b so atoms uh, of zero atomic number bearing the same basis functions as the real uh, atoms of b okay so this way there uh, is no effect of atomic nuclei on extra or extra electrons on a just uh, the available of b basis functions okay likewise one ghosh orbital of a on b also we can calculate so in this way we can uh, now uh, remove the basis set superposition error which is coming due to their superpositions of the two molecules so another corrections are uh, uh, can be also done very easily and that is actually if you use very high basis set okay means that if you each fragment a and b is endowed with a very big basis set then extra functions from other fragment won't alter the energy much okay the energy will alter, uh, already will be in the, at the limiting energy okay so if we uh, simply ca cal uh, 
do the calculations on A, B and AB with a significantly big basis set, the state forward procedure for uh, subtracting energy of AB from that of A plus B, you will get the stabilization energy. Okay. So, uh, nevertheless, the counterpoise method is the standard way of overcoming BSS and BSAC and the counterpoise corrections is important to weakly bound dimers like hydrogen bonded or van der Waals complexes. So, when we will perform the calculations or computers in the lab, we will uh, correct this BSAC for this water dimer. Okay. So, this will be a topic of the practical and you will uh, see how we can correct the energy. Okay. Thank you very much. This is uh, all about the basis set. Please read carefully all the lectures and if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you very much.